people will start consuming porn. It's very vanilla. It might be girl, girl. It might just be like cinematic, whatever. It's just nothing that anyone would categorize as a kink, fetish, violent, any of that. And then eventually what happens to everyone, David, is... There are women or people in general who may verbally consent to sex, but are non-verbally saying no. So how does that work in the legal system, though? People may identify, yeah, I consented to sex, but then all of a sudden when my partner started choking me, um, I hadn't consented to that. Fascinating how people can't separate the entertainment value right. of porn versus taking it as a documentary. Porn sex is not what real sex looks like. It doesn't show you the negotiation. It doesn't show you the lube. It doesn't show you the preparation. It doesn't show you the aftercare. When somebody engages in a BDSM or a sexual scene with you, and then they care enough to do aftercare, mm -hmm. it leaves the person with the feeling that David, it's so good to see you, and in person. Likewise, really last time we were just uh, remote, it's fun to be in person. Yeah, yeah, so um, what is it you're currently working on? I think the last episode we did, we focused mostly on like, quote, sex and porn addiction. Right, um, you know, it's a little different, but one of the things that I've really um, pivoted into is I'm doing a lot of expert witness work um, in the courts. Um, uh, sexuality issues are ending up in the court system more and more and more, and I'm being brought in to educate juries about sexual diversity, about consent, about the influence of alcohol on sexuality, um, just trying to help them make decisions from a place of good information as opposed to a lot of the myths that people hold mm -hmm. about sexuality, um, which actually this conference, you know, the Sexual Health Alliance is really dedicated towards um, combating these myths around, you know, and, and increasing sex, sex education, just trying to increase people's acceptance of sexual diversity. And so, you know, um, at conferences like the Sexual Health Alliance Sexolo Sexology Conference, that's what it's all about. And then I kind of take that same information into the court system and try to spread that information so that um, people make uh, the best decisions possible. So what are some of the most common myths that you see in the courtroom or just in public in general? Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> that, um, uh, you know, people who like kinky sex are deviates, um, that people who like sex in general must have been traumatized in childhood, that porn performers, you know, are all drug addicts or um, damaged people, um, that women don't like sex. Um, and that women can't enjoy kind of, uh, you know, more kinky or aggressive sex. Um, that's one of the things that I'm brought in oftentimes. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing a lot, and, and a lot of people are talking about this, is that young people, particularly, uh, you know, older adolescents, young 20s, are engaging in choking during mm -hmm. sex more. And there, it's a complicated issue. I mean, this was has been around a long time. People were, uh, I remember choking when I was a teenager, and I'm in my 50s. But now, uh, men seem to be learning about it from porn. Women, interestingly, are mostly learning about it from social media or from memes. Mm. And the problem is that they're engaging in what I call varsity level sex when they've never even played on the JV team, mm -hmm. right? So they don't know how to negotiate rough sex. Um, they don't know how to identify, you know, kind of safe words or ways to stop. Um, and they're oftentimes doing it with people that they don't know very well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, rough sex is not something you do the first time you have hookup sex with somebody. Uh, I'm, I, Absolutely. I, I don't have a whole lot of universals, but that's one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, and then what I'm seeing is that a lot of the men, and these are younger men, um, they don't know how to. They don't know how to follow up after sex. Mm. Um, so it's interesting in the kink world in BDSM aftercare is interestingly regarded as a sign of consent. Now, aftercare comes after the sexual encounter. So it's a post facto sign of consent because when somebody engages in a BDSM or a sexual scene with you, and then they care enough to do aftercare, mm -hmm. it leaves the person with the feeling that, oh, you know, this is, I, I was treated well, this person cared about me. 
But if somebody engages in a BDSM or a sex scene and then kind of ghosts them, walks away, it's easy for a person to feel taken advantage of, exploited. Mm. And that's one of the things that I'm seeing in a lot of cases I've been involved in, with, with kind of hookup sex. And then typically the male um, kind of ghosts the female or, or doesn't know how to talk to her afterwards. And then she ends up feeling exploited. And in some cases, um, ends up filing sexual assault charges. And it gets very, very complicated figuring out what was consensual, what wasn't, um, how did this evolution and kind of perception of consent happen. We've been seeing a lot of this since the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. and and I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. That's really interesting because if you do have some kind of designated aftercare, you could take something that could have been like a really gray area of consent. Like it wasn't necessarily forceful or there wasn't malicious intent. It was just maybe something that didn't make you feel good. And right. then in that post aftercare, you can be like, oh, clearly he didn't mean to do whatever. And it's so much easier to forgive and then kind of absorb right. in a healthier way versus like, oh, he he meant to do this right. and kind of yeah. villainize the guy automatically. So with most consent and most language in general, I think it's over 90% of communication is nonverbal. Right. And uh, especially when it comes to sex, there is this new phenomenon that people are saying is happening due to social media, mostly anything technological. So if you're spending a lot of time scrolling um, or zoning out and watching Netflix, watching a ton of time watching porn, that it actually makes you less able to read nonverbal cues and mm -hmm. almost in a way that it shows up a little bit autistic. And um, depending on how much consumption is happening. So if you take that and then not being able to read facial cues, especially during sex, how much of a problem that's going to be. Right. So what's the solution? Is it, I like the aftercare method much more than having verbal consent throughout the entire thing because that ruins, that ruins it. Yeah. And I don't want to sign something before because that's also freaking right. weird. It's, yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, um, you know, certainly I've been in sexual situations where, you know, I'm checking in with a person and then they're like, stop asking me. Right. You know? That would be me. Like, stop shut being up. sexy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and social media and technology here just gets complicated. I mean, when when people have interacted um, by social media b um, before their first date, they're more likely to have sex on the first date because they feel like they know each other, even mm -hmm. though you know the person they know through social media is just kind of like the person I interview for a job, right? I'm not meeting that person, I'm meeting their representative. <laughs> social media, I'm not meeting that person, I'm meeting the person that they wanna be or that they wanna th have people think they are. Um, and then males typically communicate consent non-verbally Females typically can communicate consent verbally, but females think males communicate consent not verbally. Males think females c communicate consent non-verbally. <laughs> and so it's this mismatch that uh -huh. rarely gets talked about. I mean, during Me Too, um, you know, we were talking before we started about autism and our kind of shared experiences with, with, with folks with autism. And um, during the Me Too movement, I had, uh, I can't tell you how many males that were on the spectrum who said to me, look, I, I'm hearing that there are women or people in general who may verbally consent to sex, but are non-verbally saying no, mm. that this is too much. And those guys on the spectrum were saying to me, I can't do that. I can't. I, I can't read the nonverbal cues. That, that, that's part of my issue. Mm -hmm. And they were really, really nervous about how to make this work. And so we did a lot of work, you know, talking about how to identify consent, but also, as you said, how to, how to also keep it sexy. Mm -hmm. So how does that work in the legal system, though? So if so much of it is nonverbal, and then downstairs they were talking about, and I, I loved it so much, there are... Um, there are consent violations and then there are consent mistakes like a yeah. right and they are different and intent does matter and i know so many people that have taken a consent mistake and tried to make it into this big legal thing and to me that's so gross because the legal and social ramifications of someone that gets uh, found guilty of any of that it's 
it's a massive consequence. So I think you need to take that into account. So what you have something that comes to a uh, court case and right. it's so gray and it's not like most people are recording it. So there's, it's all kind of hear, hearsay. He said, she said, yeah. how does that get handled? Like how, what are the outcomes typically? Um, complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, first, uh, you know, that language, you know, consent mistakes, consent violations, you know, sexual assault, we like to think that's on, that, that, that that's on a pretty clear spectrum, mm-hmm. but it's really not. And certainly the court system uh, doesn't handle some of that nuance very well. Um, the, uh, you know, the, there's a case I'm involved with in Asia right now where um, the judge has, has really come back and said, you know, it's a simple yes or no, was there consent or not? And where people like me come in and kind of upset people is where I say, you know, it, it's complicated. Um, so, for instance, with choking sex, uh, one of the things I see is that people may identify, yeah, I consented to sex, but then all of a sudden when my partner started choking me, um, I hadn't consented to that. And so then at that point, this stops being consensual. Um, one of the things with, with alcohol, for instance, um, you know, alcohol for women uh, dramatically increases their ability or willingness to express sexual arousal, to express sexual desire, and to agree to sex. But alcohol on board for a female uh, decreases the chances that she's going to orgasm, increases the chances that she'll engage in unprotected sex, and increases the chances that she will later identify the uh, the sexual encounter as non-consensual. Um, so it it's really tough. I mean, one of the things I one of the things I'm telling young people right now is that. It, sex, especially varsity level sex like I'm talking about, um, that's something that you do with people you trust. And, and I, I, I don't mean to sound like an old fuddy-duddy, but, um, but, but as you said, you, you know, th- this, you know, Candace, this, this world is a new world in a lot of these ways. And in, in some ways it's a really better world because I want to make sure that people are protected and that people who, whose rights are violated have the ability to get support. But at the same time, we have not, um, we've not kept up and we've not educated people about how to navigate this more complicated world. And so, you know, again, as I said a moment ago, um, hookup sex is not the time to engage in kinky sex. Hookup sex is not the time to engage in rough sex, even though that might be your thing. And that's the thing that, really, that you really enjoy. But if you're encountering this with somebody you don't know, and you don't know where their boundaries are, you don't know that they know where your boundaries are. You know, my wife and I have been married 25 years, and, you know, we can communicate non-verbally really freaking well. But on our first date, we couldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of one of the challenges. I mean, I... Um, I, I am not a moral panic person when it comes to pornography, but one of the things about pornography that I do recognize is that it has introduced young people to concepts of, again, varsity level sex that they're not prepared to manage and integrate into their life in a, in, in a, in a thoughtful way. Um, and that's one of the places where I think we need to do a lot better work. I mean, one of the things that you know, is happening here at the conference is people talking about how do we integrate more effective sex education. Um, and one of the things that people keep talking about is um, porn literacy and helping you know, people, and particularly young people, to know that you know, porn is not an accurate depiction of sex. Porn sex is not what real sex looks like. It doesn't show you the negotiation. It doesn't show you the lube. It doesn't show you the preparation. It doesn't show you the aftercare. Um, Unfortunately, what research with young people shows us is that the young people who have not gotten sex education are the people who are most likely to view pornography as realistic depiction of sex. Mm. So they're the ones most likely to learn unhealthy lessons from sex. We haven't, we haven't figured out how to counteract that yet. 
Yeah, to me, it's always um, it's fascinating how people can't separate the entertainment value right. of porn versus taking it as a documentary. Yeah. But you can watch Jason Bourne, and you very much see Matt Damon if you bump into him on the street, and like it's Matt Damon. That's not Jason Bourne. You're not going to try to fight him or go right. in a car right. chase. Right. But when someone approaches or sees their favorite porn star, like automatically they dehumanize you really quick. You are very much your character. You must want sex all of the time, mm. and then the content that you're creating is is real and accurate and educational. So I don't understand why it's so easy to watch mainstream film and understand that that's entertainment. And then when you watch porn, everyone's like, well, I didn't know it wasn't educational. Really? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> like all the signs yeah. are there that that is not comfortable, pleasurable or realistic right. for most people. Yeah. You didn't learn to drive by watching Fast and the Furious. No. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah, you went to a driving school and you learned how to go 20 miles an hour. Mm hmm. Um, you know, when we were at dinner the other night, Candace, you know, you said something and, and it just, you just sparked my memory that um, people feel like they have access to or ownership, maybe even, uh, maybe not the right word, but access to porn performers identity and body in a way that they don't seem to have access to other performers. It, would, would that seem accurate? Mm-hmm. Like a different level of expectation, like they owe them yeah. something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's the, I forget the technical term, but it's when you feel you a parasocial relationship. Right. And I think nice. maybe, I don't know the uh, neuroscience behind it, but I would venture to say that maybe it's because of everything that's firing off and like the power of an orgasm while you're watching that content, that maybe it makes that relationship a little bit more toxic than if you're just watching your favorite movie star. But we do see people that do have an unhinged r relationship with like Taylor Swift or right, a, right. A, a rock star or what have you. Um, so I don't, I don't know if it's more prevalent or if it's just more obvious. I agree. I mean, I think it... I would say it, it does seem at a different level in that I see people who don't act um, intrusively or obsessively that way towards mainstream mm -hmm. kind of content, but do act that way towards performers, mm -hmm. towards, towards adult performers. Um, I don't like talking about the brain very much because um, to me it externalizes. Um, you know, when we talk about neurons, when we talk about neurochemicals, it's the same to me as talking about demons in the 15th century. <laughs> it externalizes. I want to talk about the person. Okay. And so instead, what I would say is for people that don't have much access to their sexual selves, for people that have kept their sexuality secret and locked up, it can feel deeply connecting in kind of a fake way to sh sort of share sexuality with a porn performer. I mean, think about, I can't tell you how many men I've seen who, you know, a little later in life, 20s and 30s and 40s, you know, f finally have sex for the first time. And they immediately fall in love with the person that they had sex with, even though that wasn't really what was, what was happening. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of phenomenon, I think, in terms of um, that, that, that can lead to this over-identification and possessiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the solution to that. I always try to practice like my business side of adult content very ethically. I've always been open that I'm in a relationship or that I have kids or that we are both engaging in a fantasy together. I've never right. been one of those performers. I met this one woman and this is not unusual, unfortunately. And she's like, I just want to milk everyone dry. And she would keep people online 24 seven if she could and literally not care if she's ha like, you know, taking their mortgage. To me, that's that's so fucked up. I think that you do have a responsibility, a responsibility, especially when nowadays everything is kind of so decentralized and you're you're chatting with your fans directly. Right. So it's it's getting even more intimate, and it's getting those yeah. lines and boundaries are getting even more murky. So I, I think you're doing yourself a disservice, and and fundamentally, it's just unsafe yeah. that if you're practicing that way. So I mean, I'm not online 24/7. I take a long time to get back. If someone is behaving in a way that I think is unhealthy, I will tell them you need to go outside, go touch mm -hmm. grass. Like I'm not available. <laughs> for you anymore and I think I would like to see more people do that and again I think even from a selfish level it's just more safe that way too yeah I was I was consulting just the other day with um, therapists that were working with uh, patients that were into cash and financial submission mm -hmm. and um, first I have to say and if anybody knows that I'm wrong here please tell me but I have never in my life seen a female 
financial submissive. Mm. I've only seen male financial submissives who erotically connect the the, the act of giving money to an online dominant and you know and, and it makes them feel important it makes them feel like they're part of her life it makes them feel like they're supporting her um and and it's kind of a pseudo relationship mm-hmm. now she knows it's a pseudo relationship and he gets confused mm. um there was a case in florida where a guy um gave so uh, signed his house over to um his financial submissive um, and it went to court. She ultimately did end up keeping the house. Whoa. Um, but these things do get complicated. And just like you said, um, there certainly are folks out there that engage unethically and are exploiting. I mean, I one of the things, again, that, that you know, we talk about here at the Sexual Health Alliance is the six principles of sexual health. And so whenever I'm out there, you know, challenging some moral panic narratives about sex, People always think, you know, that, oh, David just wants, you know, free for all sex. David just wants an unboundaried sexual environment where anybody can do everything. And absolutely not. What, what we come back with is, what is healthy sex? For us, healthy sex is sex that has consent, honesty, safety in terms of pregnancy or STIs, shared values, non-exploitation, and pleasure. So one of the things I say to people is, you know, you say, here we are in a hotel, and if I meet somebody at the hotel bar, and we hit it off, and 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 I say to I say to you, you know, I'm really looking for a relationship, and you and I feel like um, we could really make something happen. We go up to the hotel room, and we have crazy hot sex. I mean, there's orgasms everywhere on the ceiling, in the bathroom, everywhere. <laughs> the next morning, I leave, and I don't call you because I was lying. I didn't really want a relationship, but I knew you did. Mm. Is that healthy sex? It might have been really pleasurable sex. It was mutual sex, but we didn't have shared values. I wasn't being honest. And I was exploiting you. Mm -hmm. That's not healthy sex. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, coming back to your example, you know, can a, can a dominant engage in healthy sex with a submissive? I think so, but it requires attention to this exploitation. Now, he wants to be exploited. That's what gets him off. Mm-hmm. But there's also a line. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Oh, what, I had a question. Oh, um, regarding moral panic and pornography or anything around sex in general, do you think that stems from just lack of education and understanding, or do you think it's more ideological and uh, it's about power, control, lack of freedom for individuals to express the way that they want, combination of both? Yes. 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 Just yes. Yes. Just yes to all that. I mean, I, um, you know, Candice, you ask good questions. Um, <laughs> Thanks. One of the things I try to be empathic about is with people who fear sex. Mm -hmm. And I I will say that folks on my side of the aisle that are out there doing education around sex, I I think many of us don't empathize with the people who are afraid of sex. And sometimes people get angry at us, people like you and I who are living our best sexual lives. And they don't want us to be able to live our best best sexual lives and and my belief at this point is because they are angry that at some point the ability to live their best sexual life was taken away from them or that they gave up the opportunity and they're angry at us for living a life that they never got to have i think that that is is a feeder to a lot of the moral panic um and, and, and anger for me as a therapist is always a secondary emotion. There's always some emotion that comes first, and then you get angry. If you jump out at me and I'm, I'm out of an alley, you scare me, and then I get angry and I beat the shit out of you. So why are these people angry over sex? And a lot of it is fear that these changes in sexuality that are coming out of our society with non-monogamy, with kink, with pornography, with, um, with all of these different kind of sexual expressions, people are afraid that that's going to change sexuality and it's gonna take away the kind of sex that they like or that they want. 
I had a woman stand up in an audience um, one time, and she said to me, David, I truly believe that pornography and casual sex pose a threat to the continued existence of the human race. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, I don't know how to engage with you here. First, casual sex is how babies are made, so I'm just going to challenge you there. But, <laughs> but that's, the, that's the level of fear that is feeding this moral panic. And certainly, you know, religious communities view pornography as a threat to their way of life, as a threat to their sexual values. And sadly, you know, we see that. People who watch pornography over time become less religious. And I call it the, the lightning didn't strike phenomenon, where, you know, they were taught, you know, anybody who has gay sex or kinky sex or masturbates or, you know, performs oral sex or whatever, that, that bad things are gonna happen to them. God doesn't like you. And then they watch these people on screen and nothing happens to them. Nothing happens to the people on screen, nothing happens to them watching it. And then they become more accepting of their own sexual interest. You know, when people start watching pornography, typically they watch very vanilla porn. But then after they are watching pornography for a little while, and again, they, they see nothing bad happens. They become more accepting of sexual diversity. And so suddenly, you know, their, their deep, dark, secret interest in watching fart porn all of a sudden becomes a little more acceptable. Maybe I'll check that out. <laughs> now it looks like what we call content progression. It I was gonna looks ask that. like mm -hmm. it look you know, in, in, in alcohol, you know, um, when I was a kid and I, I first drank a beer, I got tipsy, right? Now I can drink probably six or seven beers before I feel anything. That's a that, that, that's tolerance. Do we see the same thing with pornography? Well, when I was a kid, I could look at the, you know, Fredericks of Hollywood catalog and get aroused and masturbate. If I looked at it now, if, if it even exists, I don't know if, they're, if, if they make those catalogs. They're still around. Okay, that's yeah. amazing. Good. <laughs> Yay. Yay, Fredericks. Um, I might look at it and say, oh, that looks kind of nice. I buy that for my wife, but I'm not going to get so turned on and masturbate. Now, is that because of a, a, a tolerance phenomenon? Or is it the fact that, you know, I'm in my 50s and it takes a lot more work for me to get turned on and it takes a lot, l lot longer for me to orgasm? So we can't separate the developmental changes. Um, and then what we do know about people that watch pornography is that in general, their pornography use is very boring. People find the same, people watch the same kind of porn over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. They may divert a little bit. Um, people that are into BDSM sometimes will divert into shoe fetishes. Uh, webmasters of porn, of porn sites discovered this about 10 years ago, that if they put up videos of shoe fetish along with videos of BDSM, when somebody s searched out femdom or BDSM, some guys would, would click on the shoes. So there is this cross-relational thing. But in general, people find something that turns them on, mm -hmm. and they go back to that well over and over and over again. Often, now in men, they'll typically look for different versions of that same stimuli. Mm -hmm. But they find what turns them on, because pornography is something that makes it easier to come. That's what pornography is. It is a tool to increase arousal and make it easier to achieve orgasm. Mm -hmm. So that's what people use it for. And then they go on with their day. But they find what turns them on and makes it easier to orgasm. And that's what they go back to over and over again. So then the other part of it is that there's a learning phenomenon, right? We're conditioning that response, building it over and over again. Um, but. I, it's so fa it's so funny when you hear the arguments that some people make. So um, one of the ones I see all of the time, it talks a lot about that, how people will start consuming porn and it's very vanilla. It might be girl, girl, might just be like cinematic, whatever. It's mm -hmm. just nothing that anyone would categorize as a kink, fetish, violent, any of that. And then eventually what happens to everyone, David, is you will watch start watching child abuse, uh, sexual abuse content. Right, and you're gonna become yeah. a predator, or 
you become a serial killer. So one thing that I see this one group pushing are these Jeffrey Dahmer interviews. And there's this quote by him, and, or maybe it's Ted, Ted it's Bundy. Ted Bundy. Ted, Ted Bundy. Bundy. Yeah, and yeah. he's like, never watch porn because right. you'll end up here. Yeah. And it's like, okay, what you're doing right now is you're doing, you're saying something that almost everyone has participated in at least one time in their life. Like, um, find me a male that has never seen anything explicit. You're not going to. Yeah, the research is about 97% of men, 89% of women. Um, right. will have seen porn in their life. Right, so take that large number. It's almost like who's drank, drank water. Well, mm-hmm. we all have done that, but one person did something super right. evil, right. so now that's going to happen to everyone. It's like how many people have consumed this in a healthy way, and they didn't end up hurting a kid or killing a bunch of people? Right. Most people. So, And then everyone's like, see, there's there's truth to it because yeah. Bundy said it. And you're like, it makes, no. It makes me crazy. I mean, first, Ted Bundy was an antisocial narcissist, and the idea that his lies and stories are still floating around right now would probably make him really happy as he's burning in hell um, but he was interviewed by um, James Dobson who was a minister and a psychologist who created morality in the media now now called National Coalition for oh, opposing sexual exploitation or something like that and um, uh, Bundy told Dobson what he wanted to hear and you know Bundy claimed well you know I I ended up like this because I found Playboy in my neighbor's in my neighbor's uh, trash. Well, I mean, then Jesus, what what was the neighbor doing, right? <laughs> I mean, so it, it, it's this. Now, there are men um, that are misogynistic, men that are antisocial, men that um, have are, are are isolated and have anger. When though, if those men watch violent porn, it appears to increase the chances of them engaging in violent sex. But that's only estimated be t- to be between four and seven percent of men. Ninety-three percent of men mostly don't watch violent porn and don't find violent porn am- arousing. Um, and if they did, it wouldn't increase their chances of engaging in violence. But there's also no research at all that changing the pornography somebody watches reduces the risk of violence. How do we reduce the risk of violence in these men? First, we keep them sober because impulsivity and particularly substances increase violence. Secondly, we try to address where's their misogyny coming from? Why are they angry at women? As we men- were talking earlier, you know, the men that feel like they own porn performers or have a possessiveness, where's that coming from? I- I will sadly tell you that it is oftentimes coming from more conservative social values towards women that hold women out as property. Um, there's a reason why you know women in more you know stereotypically conservative um, you know sexist societies get assaulted more because they're viewed as property. Mm-hmm. So if we can start changing some of those values increasing men's ability to empath- empathize with women. One of the things I, 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 I tell a lot of men, I talk a lot about ethical pornography use and mindful pornography use. And to combat some of that possessiveness and viewing women as a sexual object, I tell men to find performers that really turn you on and then follow them on social media. Get because now you get to see them as a person and maybe you get to interact with them just like you said you find out they've got kids and they've got a dog and now we start to view this person as a person as opposed to a sexual object now sometimes being objectified or viewing others as as a sexual object is part of being aroused um I think, I think it was Freud said, at the moment of orgasm, we have to view our sexual partner as an object. Mm-hmm. We have to give up empathy and thinking about the other person in order to allow ourselves to orgasm. Mm. You know, we, as we are orgasming, we're not thinking about the other person, we're just feeling the pleasure. So there is a bit of objectification in sex. But good sex involves all of it good Mm -hmm. sex involves that connection and that acceptance of objectification um and the aftercare Mm -hmm. as we said so do you see you see all these states that are creating age verification 
and people are using VPNs to get around it. And a lot of the explanation is to protect minors or they have a big issue with just lack of paywalls, which I do too. I think there should be a paywall. I don't want my kid to be scrolling and see something that he's not ready to see. And I think the same with violence, but no one's stopping that. You can go on Instagram I, and amen, see a lot of amen. murder. I agree with you about violence. But w- I guess m- maybe let's go there first. Um, why is it okay and I guess less... People are saying it's less damaging, or at least um, their actions are saying that they think it's less damaging because no one is trying to get that content pulled off of any of these social platforms, but they're going after porn really hard. It, it just seems like a little bit of cognitive dissonance. If you're saying sex and pleasure between consenting adults is a huge problem and it's going to traumatize someone um, if they stumble upon it, but I can watch someone's head get blown off. Like, how? I don't understand. Yeah. Um, you know, I, sex is always a, a shiny object that people get distracted by. Um, It's really easy to manipulate audiences by um, pointing at sex and raising sexual fears. Um, I have to be careful here because I'm actually involved in some of the legal cases around the age verification um, issues, um, one of which is going before the Supreme Court this fall. Mm. And um, I, some, some of the things that, that I'm concerned about. One is that um, I think it is meaningful that the states that are putting these age, age verification some, uh, laws in place are all highly religious states. I think it's meaningful that consistently the politicians that, um, uh, that introduce these laws are religious. Um, I think we have to attend to those religious motivations. Um, and COSI, the National Coalition of Sexual Exploitation that I mentioned before, they have been the, a, a proponent of a lot of these laws, and they've identified in their, in their conversations that um, this is a first step to trying to restrict adult access to, to pornography. Um, I think that's something to pay attention to. Um, I'm concerned about the, the data safety um, of the information that gets collected. There's already been some hacks um, with that material. The thing I'm more concerned about, though, is something that I don't think gets talked about very much, and that the sites that comply are the bigger, more mainstream professional sites. And what happens then is consumers are then diverted towards less reputable, shady, less safe sites where it increases <laughs> salud, <laughs> it increases the potential that that pornography is not ethical. It increases the potential that, that the performers were exploited or taken advantage of. I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, pornography that comes out of Eastern Europe, for instance. You should be. Yeah, right? <laughs> you should be. Because, be, because we don't have um, much, much confidence of safety or consent. Mm-mm. Uh, the same was true, um, you know, in in American history when pornography was banned, that um, it increased, it, frankly, it increased the, the influence of organized crime in American pornography because it was criminal behavior, just like, just like prohibition increased organized crime's influence in the United States by bringing in alcohol. Mm-hmm. There's these unintended consequences. Um, that uh, I think we need to think about and pay attention to. And the, and the last thing I'll say is there are harms to young people from watching pornography, particularly, the, as I mentioned, the young people that think it's real sex, mm-hmm. a depiction of real sex. Um, now, most of the harms that we attribute to pornography with juveniles um, juvenile delinquent behavior, drug seeking behavior, early sex, engaging in risky sex. Those behaviors are also associated with growing up in an unhealthy family environment and having absent parents. Well, kids that grow up in an unhealthy environment and, and have absent parents are more likely to watch pornography. So. It is very likely that pornography is actually a third variable here and that these risky sex behaviors, drug seeking behaviors, et cetera, are coming out of the parenting and the family environment just the same way the pornography is. Is there an interaction? Probably, but this is very complicated. But all that said, 
we can protect kids from most of the negative effects of pornography by teaching them what pornography is and isn't, by starting to talk to them about what healthy sex is. And, and I'm not saying we need to be teaching kids how to masturbate. I'm not saying we need to be talking to kids about anal sex. Now, if we don't talk about anal sex, we're excluding the LGBT kids. I will acknowledge that. But what I do want us to talk, uh, talk to kids about with sex is consent and honesty and safety and shared values. And we need to reduce the shame because the Netherlands is a great example. They actually start sex education around age six or seven. Um, at young ages, they are showing children adult nude bodies, not in sexual ways, but like in the locker room, so that kids are seeing what healthy adult bodies look like. Mm -hmm. Now, these kinds of societies have lower rates of eating disorder and body image disorder than the United States does mm -hmm. because girls are growing up and seeing what real adult female bodies look like, right? They don't have these unrealistic images. These societies also have lower rates of teen pregnancy, lower rates of STI transmission, and interesting, lower rates of sexual assault because when we teach kids that sex is shameful and you can't talk about it, we are teaching victims that they have to keep their mouth shut because maybe it was their fault and they're going to get shamed for being sexually assaulted. Exactly. I try to tell so many parents that because I'll meet so many moms and their kids are even older than mine and they've never had body part discussion. I'm like, well, that's crazy. I was like, do you ever leave your kid with anyone other than you? And they're like, yeah, of course. I was like, oh, well, that's a real gamble you're taking. And they're like, what yeah. do you mean? I was like, if they don't even know what to call the part and then now they know that this isn't something we talk about at home, what happens if something happens? They're not gonna have the vocabulary to come to you. And then the mom's eyes will just bug out. And I get, I'm, I take pride in that because I'm like, maybe Good she'll job. go home and like do the right thing. And it's this weird shame that so many people have. I'm like, you're, you're the one that's introducing harm to your kid because you can't yeah. just grow up and get over it. It's not a big deal. And the body thing is really interesting. So um, my dad's side of the family is Japanese. I don't know if you've ever been to like a Korean spa or any of these Asian spas, but it's it's really uh, it's shocking and jarring if you've only ever been to like mm -hmm. white spas and it's just a bunch of people. They're, they're usually separated by sex. Um, so it's just like a bunch of ladies and they'll be 60, 70 years old, completely nude, walking around, going into different jacuzzis and steam rooms and you just see every kind of body and you're like, oh. That's these are all bodies. They all they this is the the variety that's there and it's not just like this one thing this cosmo that's telling you like if you don't look like Kate Moss that you're not good enough and you should probably just starve yourself for a few days. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Good job, Candace. I mean, I um so you sparked a thought for me. You know, you, you asked early on about the myths, you know, this myths of sexuality and um one of the most dangerous ones is uh, the myth that sexual assaults are, are, are enacted by strangers. 90% of sexual assault, particularly of children, um, is committed by people you know, mm -hmm. people the kid knows, your neighbor, your friend, you know, the friend of your family, um, you know, your, your, your uncle that you grew up with, uh, the teacher, the Boy Scout leader, your pastor, God help us all. And when we don't teach kids that, when we teach kids, oh, you know, you need, you need to be afraid of that, uh, of, of that strange person down there that we don't know, we're missing the target. Mm -hmm. And because we need to help kids be aware of their immediate surroundings. Um, what, I, what I tell parents is, you know, these, you can't have one 10 minute conversation. You have to have a thousand 10 second conversations. Mm -hmm. And the one time you punish your kid for asking you a question about these issues, they will never come to you again. Mm -hmm. And now they're on your own. Mm -hmm. You just isolated your kid to potentially suffer whatever consequences they are going to suffer all alone. Mm hmm. It's so scary when our kids come to us and ask these questions, but this is the world we created and it ain't going back. Mm -hmm. um, Pandora's box is not closing and whether it's age verification, um, et cetera, we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna protect anybody by, by hiding from this material. You know, and I, I teach kids 
that you know the internet is you know an interesting fun scary place and there are amazing things out there and sometimes there are things that you'll see that make you feel weird and scared and when that happens come to me and talk to me about it there are people out there that might be gross or awful to you and when that happens it's not your fault come to me and talk to me about it mm -hmm. um i think we we need to we need to inoculate kids against these things and that's us taking responsibility for the world we created Exactly. Make them anti-fragile in a sense, yeah. right? Like don't put them in this bubble and, and you're actually doing them a disservice because when they come across anything that is troublesome or could be harming, harmful, they don't have the tools or equipment or even know that they have support to go to and how to handle it. So that yeah. makes way 100%. more sense because you can't, you can't. No. Right? Yeah, it, you can't. It, maybe for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, uh one of the things that most sex educators know, you know, here at the Sexual Health Alliance, again, you know, lot, lots of conversations about sex education. You don't hear anybody here talking about abstinence because mm -hmm. what we know is that abstinence-only education um, increases the chances that youth will engage in unprotected sex when they engage in sex. So where does where do people get the information? Because Candace Owens did this episode, and she was saying the exact opposite. She was saying that once we introduced sex education into uh, schools back in, I don't know, maybe the 50s or something, she said as soon as we introduced that, there was a skyrocket, like a hockey stick of teen pregnancies. Is that just like completely contrived? Like, um, I, Well, I mean... First, um, in the 50s, we didn't have the pill. And so there was much greater uh, restricted access to contraception. So um, we're kind of comparing apples and oranges here. Okay. Um, secondly, I, I, will, I will acknowledge that, that the research is a little more nuanced. When abstinence-only education is presented and there are no other options of sex education, it increases the risk of unprotected sex. And interestingly, when, um, it, remember purity rings, mm -hmm. when um, there was this fascinating research that um, a lot of people uh, put on purity rings and made purity pledges because of peer pressure. When a small, when less than 50% of your social group makes a purity pledge, the people that make the purity pledge are more likely to try and stick to it. But when more than 50% of your peer group makes a purity pledge, a lot of people are unlikely to stick to it because they're just doing it for peer pressure. Um, when we compare uh, you know, um, comprehensive sex ed to abstinence-only sex ed, folks that get education about contraception and are, to are not told the best answer is no, best answer is wait till marriage. They're more likely to use contraception during first, preg during, during first sex um, and compared to abstinence only where they're not likely to have a condom. They haven't prepared to have sex. They didn't mm -hmm. think they were ever gonna have sex until they get married and then they're on a date and they get really turned on and they haven't thought through or even been talked through how to get a condom or even how to put a condom on. Um, at, we see the same with pornography, interestingly, that you know, the, the men that um, try to abstain from pornography use and masturbation, that 90% of pornography use is accompanied by masturbation, so most anti-pornography discussions are really anti-masturbation discussions. The men that try to abstain from pornography and masturbation increase their distress, anxiety, and depression. And Unfortunately, as, as human beings, we're just not really good at this. We're not really good at stopping doing things, but we are good at starting doing things. So what I tell patients is, whether it's around sex, whether it's about pornography, um, let's talk about the healthy behaviors that you want to do more of rather than these unhealthy behaviors you're afraid of or you want to give up. Let's energize the healthy behaviors. You want to exercise. You want to go out and socialize. You want, to, you want to try and get a job. Every time you come back and see me, those are the things I'm going to ask about. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask about the unhealthy behaviors because you already got that. You already know how to do that really well. Let's talk about these healthy behaviors that you want to practice. Mm -hmm. Let's incentivize and reinforce those. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is, again, um, you know, 
the problem I have with with folks like Candace or, or, or the you know the, the folks that want to control access to pornography or want to stop these negative behaviors because they're not adequately talking about what healthy behaviors they want more of um, and then talking about how we get more of that um, there's a common belief in the uh, on that side of the aisle that you know men who watch pornography are less likely to want to get married but in fact, a sociologist in Oklahoma, a friend of mine named Sam Perry, he actually did research on this. And so um, uh, it's the don't give away the milk for free because nobody will buy the cow kind of belief, right? Mm -hmm. Grandma used to say this. If you, have, if you give away sex, nobody, nobody, no guy's going to want to marry you. Mm -hmm. But it turns out men who watch pornography want to get married more than men who don't watch pornography. Interesting. Because watching pornography is an indicator of libido and sexual interest. Mm. And guys who watch pornography and guys who are masturbating know that guys who are married are more likely to have sex than guys who are not. Single men have less sex than married men over, on average. That's also surprising because you always hear about the death of the marital bed. Yeah, but sex once a week... Mm -hmm is a lot more than the single guy who hasn't a, had a date in three months. Mm -hmm. It's getting harder to date. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both women and men are getting a lot more picky. I mean, we've, we've got the whole, you know, um, dating app thing. I was talking to somebody last, this morning or last night, I forget, about, um, you know, the, the way people shop on dating apps, that they, they decide, you know, uh, I know a lot of women, that, you know, I, I, I'm only attracted to men that are over six feet tall, and I want a guy that, you know, with this kind of hair and looks like this and does this for a living. And then they, so they limit themselves to those kinds of guys on the apps. But that's not how dating and falling in love work, mm -hmm. you know? We, we oftentimes fall in love with people we're surprised that we find ourselves attracted to because mm -hmm. I didn't think they were my type. <laughs> and so I see a lot of people get, get into this, you know, swipe left, swipe left, swipe, oh, swipe, you know, kind of as opposed to, huh, let me get out and explore the world and see who I connect with. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated world, and, and, and I guess what I want, you know, I want to have complicated answers for these complicated questions. Mm -hmm. oh. So the inverse, so men that watch porn are more likely to want to get married. Yeah. How does that work for women? So women that participate mm. in more sex, are they less likely to get married? Because that's also, the we're the cow, usually. <laughs> when you talk about the you cow. You are so <laughs> not a cow. I mean, I'm looking at you right now. I'm not thinking bovine. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. So, you know, that's a complicated question. Um, men and women, and and yeah, I'm gendering this because that that's how this stuff breaks out. Now there now there are people that don't fit into these categories, and I am all about um, trying to include that data and that research. But when we look overall. Single women actually don't watch pornography very much compared to women who are in relationships and watch pornography with their partner. Mm -hmm. um, most female pornography consumption is with a male partner. Um, women who have sex more masturbate more. Women who have sex less masturbate less. And, uh, you know, a, 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 there's a researcher, Sari Van Anders, that actually looked at neurochemicals and, and, and hormones for this. I said a minute ago I wasn't going to talk about it, but here it is. So um, that uh, single women have low testosterone levels that correlate oftentimes with low sexual interest. When women have sex more, they want sex more. When women have sex less, they want sex less. Um, men who uh, are single actually tend to have higher testosterone levels typically because they're masturbating more and watching more pornography, which increases your, your, your testosterone levels. The idea that it reduces testosterone levels is a complete debunked myth, absolutely disproven. Um, but 
when men get married, and particularly when men get married and have a kid, their testosterone levels plummet. What's really interesting in Sari's research is that men who are in non-monogamous relationships, their testosterone levels look the same as men who are single because the testosterone levels are correlating with novelty-seeking sexual experiences. We don't really see that with women, mm -hmm. that women's sexuality is, and women's sexual response is more often um, reactive or responsive with their partner. And there are certainly many women I know who don't fit that, who have a high uh, sexual interest, high sexual sensation seeking. They're seeking out casual sex, and, and I get that. Again, I'm talking about the big average. Um, in terms of, you know, women watching pornography or engaging in casual sex and with a desire for marriage, that's interesting. I. I don't know that there's data to really evaluate that the way that there is in men, but we also don't have the myth. We also don't have that belief in, in women that women who are casual, who are into casual sex will never get married. Well, I think it's more from um, an external value, like perceived value. So if she's doing that, does that make her less desirable to a future partner? And then I guess also if we're going to talk about sex drive and masturbation and porn use for women, is that encompassing erotica as well? Or is that, because that's harder to track because if you're doing an audio book or yeah. you're buying something at right, Barnes yeah. & Noble, how do you have that data? Yeah, it's harder to track. My The audio book in my first book, uh, in Insatiable Wives, women about cuckolding and hot wifing. It was read by Rose Carraway, the naughty librarian. She's famous for reading erotica, um, and she's a friend of mine. And said she wanted to cross over into mainstream, and so she read my book. And it's amazing because it's kind of sexy hearing <laughs> her read my first book. Um, yeah, women more often are seeking out, you know, uh, romance novels, erotica, erotic fiction, audio erotica, etc. I include that in porn okay. because, again, for me, pornography is any media that we use to enhance our arousal and increase our ability to achieve orgasm. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> does it, you know, does does sexual experience, you know, decrease uh, ability to achieve a partner? Is, you know, lots of the trad wife kind of folk are out there saying, you know, oh, well, if, you know, talking about her body count, well. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just always laugh because I remember Mae West, you know, the famous um, actress in the 1920s and 30s, and she said, you know, men like a woman with a sexual past because they're hoping history will repeat itself. <laughs> and I, again, I think that trad wife kind of model or that idea that if her body count is too high, there's something damaged about her. I, that's a troubling idea to me. And it, and it also goes back to this, it goes back to the days of the dowry mm -hmm. that, you know, the female sexuality is a property. Mm -hmm. um, that, that doesn't work so well for women. And frankly, it doesn't work so well for men. Um, I can't, you know, there, there's so many men from those societies who fantasize about their wife being a slut. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, cuckolding um, is more popular in conservative males because they mm. they are fantasizing about the taboo idea of their wife being sexually promiscuous, being insatiable, mm -hmm. having multiple men. Um, yeah, I read this fascinating research about um, men from societies in Africa that still practice, uh, you know, female genital mutilation, uh, you know, removal of the uh, clitoris. Although, of course, it, it only removes the tip of the clitoris. The clitoris, again, here at the Sexual Health Alliance Conference, you know, there, there's giant clitorises all over the place. And it's not just the nub that you, that you can find if you're, you know, if you go looking. Um, but it's this whole deep organ. Women from those societies are oftentimes still able to achieve orgasm because of that deeper tissue, but it takes more work. But amazingly, men from those societies go to brothels and sex workers in other societies who still have the clitoris and fetishize it. They want women who are sexually responsive. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 
you know, that, that idea of female sexuality as property um, and, and possessiveness and control. Uh, humans have never been good at controlling sex. If we had been, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have survived as a species. Um, I don't think this is going to work either. Mm -hmm. Well, David, I could go for hours, but we are... Jamie's got us wrapping up. Um, I would love to do this again. Always. I love whenever, talking to you, Candace. Yeah, whenever. Um, do you want to tell the listeners where they can follow you, how they can support you? Um, pl shamelessly plug away. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, yeah, plug me, baby. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, at Dr. David Lay on Twitter um, and on uh, Instagram. Uh, I know Lay sounds like getting laid, but it's actually spelled L-E-Y. And, um, yeah, I, I've got a website, davidlayphd.com. You can find my books most places. Um, I'm pretty easy to find. If you want to reach out to me, I'm always happy to talk about these issues. Thanks. Thank you again. Bye, everybody. <laughs>